Every now and then in worship, we just get a, like, a little glimpse of what it will be like when all God's people uh, come together and sing His praises. And thank you for giving us a little taste, uh, Daniel and Lois. Yeah. Uh, this morning, we, we launch into a new series, and I'm very excited about it. I know you hear me say I'm excited about every new series, but uh, that's true. Uh, this particular series will be in what's called the Beatitudes, the first lines of the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, the opening lines of Jesus' sermon. These statements, uh, called Beatitudes, are uh, what we're calling the kingdom ethic in a series called Kingdom Citizens. We're in a very unique and difficult and challenging season as a nation, and for us as American citizens, those of us who are, uh, and more importantly, citizens of, of the kingdom of heaven, of the kingdom of God. And how do we walk in faithfulness to him in the midst of this season? This is the perfect uh, approach and series for us. Because now more than ever, we need to be crystal clear and laser focused on what it means to be citizens of Christ's kingdom on earth. Uh, and so we're going to be digging into that. And I'm excited to have Dr. John Dixon launch this series. Uh, last year, we were in a series called The Way, The Way of Jesus. And I heard him preach from the Beatitudes. I remember thinking, sitting where you're sit seated, we need to do a series on this because it's perfect for us, and that was the beginning of that. So thank you for that, and he's the perfect person uh, to begin this series. Before he comes, though, I want us to stand together and read responsively these, these statements from Matthew chapter 5 called the Beatitudes. I'll read, and you respond. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, the disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now, before you're seated, let's welcome our favorite Australian professor and preacher, Dr. John Dixon. Yeah. You know a lot of Australian professors and preachers, don't you? Glad to be the favorite. Uh, well, yeah, as Jeff said, um, we begin a series on the so-called Beatitudes, which are the opening eight lines of the Sermon on the Mount. And actually, these lines open up the whole of Jesus' teaching. They're, they're like keys that open up the whole thing. And I sometimes feel like the Beatitudes should, should come with a content warning, uh, because um, they've got a lot to answer for. Lives have been transformed by these words. Uh, empires have been overthrown by these words. That's not an exaggeration. So, fair warning. In fact, uh, Buff and I were watching the BBC and saw an interview with this man, Mossab Yusuf. Uh, he was the heir apparent to one of the founders of Hamas, this is the Palestinian-based terror group that perpetrated the horrors of October 7 last year. And uh, Masab Yusuf grew up in this family that was central to Palestinian resistance and terror. In fact, he, in this interview we saw, was saying that um, growing up, he used to get regular phone calls for his father from Yasser Arafat, the first president of the Palestinian Authority. He grew up with hatreds. He hated the Israelis who had arrested him uh, and interrogated him several times through his teens. He hated the Americans uh, whom he thought were behind support for Israel. He hated Isla uh, Islamic factions that he th thought were not as um, extreme as they should be. Hate everywhere. Musab Yusuf grew up a stone's throw from Jesus, but he was a universe away from ever 
encountering Jesus. Until a British tourist walked up to him at the Damascus Gate, the northwest gate of Old Jerusalem. Walked up to him with a New Testament and said, I don't know if you've ever read one of these, but this is a really important document. Masab Yusuf took it, was trying to be polite. He had some time in his hands, and he'd always wondered what Christianity was about. So he thought he would gratefully accept it and start reading the New Testament from the beginning. And of course, Matthew's gospel was the beginning. I began at the beginning of Matthew, he writes. And when I got to the Sermon on the Mount, I thought, wow, this guy Jesus is really impressive. Everything he says is beautiful. I couldn't put the book down. Every verse seemed to touch a deep wound in my life. It was a very simple message, but somehow it had the power to heal my soul and give me hope. And for the next few years, the figure of Jesus in Matthew's gospel haunted Masab Yusuf. As he began to think, I'm not sure I can give up my hatreds, my ancestral, political, and religious hatreds, but eventually he did. As he explains, eventually this son of Hamas became a son of God in Christ. And he writes in his autobiography, I was a devout follower of a religion that required strict adherence to rigid regulations in order to please the God of the Quran and get into heaven. I had money, power, and position in my former life. But what I really wanted was freedom. And that meant, among other things, leaving behind hate, prejudice, and a desire for revenge. The message of Jesus, love your enemies, is what finally set me free. It no longer mattered who my friends were or who my enemies were. I was supposed to love them all. And I could have a loving relationship with a God who would help me love others. Having that kind of relationship with God is not only the source of my freedom, but also the key to my new life in Jesus. Masab Yusuf found the God of meekness and mercy and peace. As I say, today we begin this series on the Beatitudes, the opening eight lines of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And we call them Beatitudes because the word blessed in Latin is Beatus, Beatus. So we call them the blessings, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, and so on. And I want to acknowledge that, of course, our hatreds are nothing compared to those of Masab Yusuf. But an election season does tend to bring out some divisions. Just saying, just as a casual observer. So let me repeat the content warning. Whether we are Masab Yusuf or a red-blooded American, or Aussie for that matter. Jesus' words have the power to upend your life and overthrow empires. My job in some ways uh, is simple today. Uh, I'm just gonna give you an overview and I'm really just gonna answer the question, what are the Beatitudes? Why do we make such a big deal of them? And I've got three simple things to say. And I want to say just right up front, the first and foremost, the Beatitudes are not political tips or life advice. The Beatitudes are first and foremost about Jesus. They're not even about us, not firstly. They're about Jesus. Why do I say this? Because it's worth noticing the amazing way that Matthew builds up in his gospel a portrait of Jesus before he lets you hear the words of Jesus. The first four chapters, he paints a picture of who you're about to hear from that so lifts the tension and admiration and even reverence so that when you get to chapter five and you hear the first words of Jesus, you're ready. The way he builds the portrait is fascinating. So in chapter one, in the famous Christmas narrative, 
He tells us that the baby Jesus was given the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That's what the word Jesus means. More than that, he, he will be given the title Emmanuel. That means God with us. So right in chapter 1, boom, we're told, Savior of the world, God with us. Okay, we turn over chapter 2, and it's the famous Magi story, and we're told that representatives of the foreign nations come to the infant Jesus and bow down and worship him. Then we turn over to chapter 3, and at first it looks like chapter 3 is about John the Baptist, who, by the way, was a very big deal in history, one of the most prominent first century figures in Judea. But even this passage, we're told that John the Baptist even said that he is not worthy to carry the sandals of the one you're about to meet. And then we turn over to chapter 4, and Matthew tells us of the enormous and diverse crowd that is flocking to hear the adult Jesus for the first time. And we're told that people came from Syria and Galilee and the Decapolis and Judea and Jerusalem and across the Jordan. And it's this crowd that gathers in chapter 5 to hear the opening words of Jesus. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and so on. But even here, right at the moment where Matthew's going to let you hear the first words of Jesus, even here, he slows things down in the grammatical equivalent of a drum roll. These first two verses are one sentence in Greek with seven verbs. Now, those of you who are teachers know that that's wrong. Unless you're trying to go... The seven verbs here, here's a literal translation. Seeing the crowds, he went up a mountain, sitting down, his disciples came to him, opening his mouth, he taught them, saying. But there's a point to all of this. The point is, we are not about to listen to yet another teacher. This is not your life coach you're about to hear. We're about to hear from the Savior, the Lord of nations. God with us, the one whose sandals none of us is worthy to carry. Mustn't approach the Beatitudes as interesting moral advice, as political tips, as a pithy saying from a fortune cookie. These are the blessings pronounced on us by the universal Lord. So meekness isn't just a life tip. It's the very mode of being of our Savior in his life, teaching, death, and resurrection. He himself was meek. Peacemaking isn't just, you know, a hot tip in tense times. No, peacemaking it's the goal of the Lord for humanity that we might be at peace. First and foremost, friends, the Beatitudes are about Jesus and the degree to which you know and revere Jesus is the degree to which you are ready to hear these words. But secondly, the Beatitudes are also about the kingdom. The kingdom. Uh, this is one of the really striking things about the Beatitudes, the double reference to the kingdom. You, you notice the first Beatitude mentions that the blessing is, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But you notice the last one has the same blessing, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Aha, uh -huh. this is what's called in nerdy land an inclusio. Now, I know that sounds like the sort of thing that should just stay locked up in a box in the theology department of Wheaton College and never let out to normal humans. But it's actually important to notice because it's a re deliberate rhetorical device to tell you what's in the box. When the first thing and the last thing is the same, kingdom, it tells you that the whole thing is about the kingdom. 
So we need to focus on the kingdom. And this is why, of course, Jeff has called this whole series Kingdom Citizens, because that's really what this is about. But what is the kingdom? What is the kingdom? The kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, refers to God proving himself king over creation by making all things well, establishing righteousness and justice and love and mercy. That's what the kingdom is. The kingdom isn't going to heaven when you die. That is not what the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God means in scripture. It's more like heaven coming to earth and making all things well. In fact, that is the precise image we get at the end of the book of Revelation. Heaven comes to earth and makes all things well. So even if you're not a believer here, like maybe you doubt this whole thing, you have hoped for the kingdom of God, I guarantee it. If you have ever wished the Almighty would do something about the mess in the world, the injustice, the bloodshed, the heartache, you have wished for the kingdom of God when God will make all things well. That's what this is. Now, the idea of the kingdom has a long backstory. It in fact goes back to 1000 BC with a very strange promise God made to King David. And the promise was of an eternal kingdom one day. Here's the passage, 2 Samuel 7. But my love will never be taken away from David's descendants as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Here it is. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And from that moment, the Jewish people were longing for a day when a descendant of King David would establish an eternal kingdom. By Jesus' day, People were very much hoping this would involve the destruction of the Romans, yeah? If you know a little bit of history, uh, in 63 BC, right? So a generation before Jesus, this jerk turned up on the block, Pompey the Great, the great general of the Roman armies. He came into Judea and he said, we'll have this. And from 63 BC, Judea and Galilee were absorbed into the Roman Empire. And from that moment on, we know the Jewish people were longing for the kingdom of God to come and smash the Romans. We know this because we've discovered a song that was sung by Jews in Jerusalem immediately after the Romans arrived. You may never have heard of this song, but historians discuss this at length. Here is the song we know they sang. The kingdom of our God is forever over the nations in judgment. See, O Lord, and raise up for your people their king, the son of David. Undergird him with the strength to destroy the unrighteous rulers, to purge Jerusalem from Gentiles, to smash the arrogance of sinners like a potter's jar, and their king shall be the Lord Messiah. Imagine growing up singing this song with this vision of the kingdom, this vision of what the Messiah will do when the Messiah comes, and then you turn up on a hill in Galilee one day and you hear a very different tune. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are the meek. The meek? What even? We should be meek toward the Romans? For they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful. You don't mean merciful even toward our enemies. They shall receive mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers. No, it's not a time for peace. For they shall be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. Theirs is the kingdom of of heaven. Do you see the point? The Beatitudes capture Jesus' vision of what the kingdom is and how his people should act in anticipation of the coming of the kingdom. That's what it is. Hold those two things in mind. It's a snapshot of the kingdom of mercy and peace and so on. But it's also a snapshot of how the people who belong to the kingdom will behave now as they wait for the kingdom to appear. 
There's a wonderful metaphor uh, of this um, offered by, uh, you may never have heard of him. His, his name is C.S. Lewis. <laughs> and yes, I know, I was here. He made an appearance last week as well. And the week before, and the week before. <laughs> but um, C.S. Lewis has this um, interesting metaphor for what it's like to live, in, live as a Christian in a hostile world. And he says it's like living behind enemy lines, living in occupied territory, but knowing that the rightful king has landed and is on his way and has begun secretly communicating with you. Isn't that a great picture? Here's how Lewis puts it. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed. You might say landed in disguise and is calling us to take part in a great campaign of sabotage. When you go to church, and I want to add, when you hear the Beatitudes, you are really listening in to the secret radio communications from our friends. Such a lovely image. The Beatitudes capture Jesus' vision of the kingdom and communicate to us, his friends, what to do now while we wait for the kingdom. Um, let me unpack each beatitude just so you can see this point that I'm trying to make. Um, we know that it's the poor in spirit who will belong to the kingdom. So we value being poor in spirit. We, we, we acknowledge our failings, we, we, we are humble. We know that the proud and the morally rich, they don't enter the kingdom. It's the, it's the lowly, it's the poor in spirit. We know that um, in the kingdom, um, our mourning will be turned to joy. And so we do grieve now the evils of the world, but we do so with confidence, knowing that all things will be made well. We know that in the kingdom, it's the meek that will inherit the new earth. So we prize meekness while we wait. We know that in the kingdom, righteousness will fill the earth and satisfy everyone. So now while we, while we wait, we hunger and thirst for righteousness, like it's our, it's our food and our drink. In the kingdom, we will all bask in the mercy of God. So now we practice mercy toward people who don't deserve it. In the kingdom, we will see God face to face. So in anticipation of that glorious encounter, we purify our hearts, don't we? In the kingdom, peace will reign. So anticipating that, we practice peace at every opportunity. And finally, in the kingdom, God will rescue all of his people from their oppressors from their persecutors. So we, now, while we wait for that, don't complain. We don't lash out. We don't grumble, look down our noses at the nasty non-Christians, no. We count ourselves blessed to belong to the rightful king who has already landed. We count ourselves blessed to belong to the only kingdom that will last. Or think of this via another metaphor. If the kingdom of God is the feature film that all of creation is waiting for, then I think of the Beatitudes as the trailer, as the preview. When we live out the Beatitudes, we are giving the world around us a little glimpse, a little preview of the coming kingdom. Your acts of mercy preview the kingdom. Your acts of meekness and peace and purity and righteousness, they're all little signals, little previews of the coming kingdom. So here is the question that confronts us in the Beatitudes. Where do our true loyalties lie? Or to turn it around another way, what is our primary citizenship? Is it with the passing kingdoms of this world? Or is it with the only kingdom that will last? In an election season, friends, 
the lines can get blurry. We can get so caught up in the contest going on right now that we can even find ourselves imagining that the most important thing going on in America right now, the most important thing going on in the world right now is the election of the 47th president. With all of scripture's authority, I'm here to say it isn't. The most important thing going on in America right now is the work of the kingdom of God through us as we practice mercy and righteousness and peacemaking. We can get so caught up in wanting the correct side to win that we forget to act like citizens of the other kingdom. So you've got to think about this. Would your friends who aren't believers, when they hear you talk, would they think your greatest loyalty is with the kingdom of God or with America? Because if we forget to talk and act with, with peace and purity and righteousness and mercy, we're acting like we're not citizens of the true kingdom. Can I offer a, 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 a stark thought experiment that you can just take or leave? I mean, I, I, we've determined that I am the backup punter. Is that right? That's, the, that's, that's what I am. I'm the backup punter, right? So, you know, so, you know I'm, I'm just going to have a big kick and we'll see how this goes. <laughs> Here's the thought experiment. If you could choose right now with a button, either a stunning victory for your preferred political party in November or a revival of Christianity in America, which would you choose? And I'm pretty sure some of you are thinking, but if my party wins, it's better for the kingdom of God. Woo, win, win. (laughs) Kingdom of God is not dependent on the kingdoms of human beings. Which would you choose? If you even hesitated in that question, I want to say the Holy Spirit wants to have a quiet word with you this morning. He he wants to take you out back. The Beatitudes are about Jesus. They are about the kingdom. Thirdly, finally, they are about grace. They are about grace. Now, if you're new to church, grace is a little shorthand we use for undeserved favor. Undeserved favor. That's what grace is. And the Beatitudes are all about the grace we receive from God, being given his kingdom, receiving his mercy, and so on, and the grace we give to others. The grace we receive from God and the grace we give to others. Now, Jeff is going to go into details uh, on this first beatitude next week, but I just want you to notice that the first beatitude, the opening lines of the kingdom, are all about grace. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven does not belong to those who are proud, who believe they have moral and spiritual credit with God, they don't get the kingdom. The kingdom belongs to those who know that they're out of credit. Now, I find this amazing because the Sermon on the Mount is the most sublime, the richest ethical discourse ever uttered, but it opens with the word that you can't do this, that you are poor in spirit, you're out of credit with God, but the kingdom is yours, it's a gift. The first word of the kingdom 
is if you acknowledge you don't deserve the kingdom, it's yours. But once you understand that grace from God, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it, to extend grace to others? If you've been loved, you will love. It's the whole logic of Christianity, basically. But think of it in terms of the Beatitudes. What is meekness? Isn't meekness just grace applied to our power? That's all it is. I've got power, whether it's political or financial or intellectual or whatever, but meekness is just applying grace to that power. Or or think of it in in terms of being merciful, being merciful to others. What's mercy? Mercy is just grace applied to others in need. Or or think of um, being a peacemaker. Isn't that just grace applied to conflict? Grace. Grace received, grace given. That's the logic of the kingdom. And don't you think we could do with some grace in our community right now? Because in an election season, things can be a little bit graceless. Am I being unfair? Some uh, friends took um, us out for dinner the other night. And this always happens. Americans are always interested to hear how these uh, funny accented people are enjoying America. Uh, how are you going? How are you liking it? Because we're coming up for two years living in America. Next Sunday is two years since we landed in this country. Woohoo! We're loving it. So these friends said, how are you finding it after two years? And we said, oh, we love this. We've got great friends. We've got a great church. Love my job, blah, blah, blah. And they said, no, 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 but really... And I was like, no, no, we really do love everything. But come on, come on. Is there anything? And we said, look, okay, there's one thing we find hard. We find it hard where it seems like half of this country despises the other half. And the other half returns the compliment. Entirely mutual. I don't think it's just my feeling because there's some data to bear this out. This is a lot to take in, but just watch this. This is a graph of attitudes of Republicans toward Democrats from 2016 to 2022. In 2016, less than half of Democrats and Republicans thought members of the opposite party were dishonest. But now look at it. The stunning majority of both parties. Um, In 2016, less than half of Republicans and Democrats thought members of the other team were immoral, but now in 2022, it's a stunning majority. They call this negative polarization. Maybe some of you are thinking, yeah, but this just proves that they are dishonest and immoral. And they're so dishonest and immoral, they think we, the good guys, are dishonest and immoral. Am I reading anyone's mind? A couple of you are like this. (laughs) Christians have a wonderful opportunity to subvert this negative polarization through grace. through some poverty of spirit, acknowledging even that we might be part of the problem. We Christians might be part of the angst going on in our language and behavior. We might be. So a bit of poverty of spirit would be good. But then we can add to that some meekness and mercy and purity of heart and peacemaking. And willingness to rejoice when abused. Of course, our divisions are nothing compared to those of Masab Yusuf 
when he was a son of Hamas. But if grace can transform him into a child of God, committed to love and peace and meekness, then grace can transform every one of us. That's my point. Grace received. Grace given. And not just for the election season. This sermon really isn't about, let's just try for the next three or four months to just be really beatitude. No, this is, this is the whole mode of existence as a Christian as we wait for the kingdom. Let me close. The Beatitudes aren't political advice or life tips. They're about Jesus. First and foremost, they are the blessings pronounced on us by the universal Lord. The Beatitudes are about the kingdom. They are the secret communications from our rightful Lord who has landed. And he's communicating his vision of the future kingdom and how we are to live in anticipation of it. And the Beatitudes are about grace. The grace we receive through the life, teaching, death and resurrection of Jesus. The free gift of the kingdom. And they're about the grace we show others in our meekness and mercy and peacemaking and so on. This is our kingdom citizenship. Lord, will you please in your mercy give us ears to hear, hearts to receive this word of the kingdom. Lord, enable us to receive your grace afresh this morning and then to go out into this world full of grace to everyone we meet. For we ask it in the name of Jesus, the embodiment of grace, crucified and risen for us. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ. And the grace of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.